Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 1, Episode 20, titled The Home Invaders. It originally premiered on March 15th, 1985. It was written by Chuck Adamson, who also wrote Give a Little, Take a Little, and then a couple of episodes we haven't watched yet, The Fix and Shadow in the Dark. It was directed by Abel or Abel Ferreira. Now, uh, I want to spend a minute here before before we really get rolling. I know last week I spent some de- some extra time on the director. I want to talk about Mr. Ferreira. He also directed another episode called The Dutch Oven. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> now, Another. you would you, you would think this is a coincidence that he would have such a titled episode. But he also so he's he's got some Michael Mann background. He directed the pilot of Crime Story and a handful of other films like King of New York, Body Snatch, the remake of Body Snatchers, and then he also directed a film titled The Nine Lives of a Wet Pussy. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> so the title of that episode was on purpose. <laughs> yes. Would have been great if you shared that tidbit before we hit record. <laughs> Jesus. I just almost spit tea all over the, the damn computer. In between making Miami Vice episodes, guy was directing porn. I don't know if it's porn or if he just, I think this is just like the way, the way he likes to name things. <laughs> Text me the name of that movie. I'll check it out for you. <laughs> Before we get oh, started, he looks super creepy too. Oh, oh. before we get started, let's check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And again, guys, two weeks in a row, we have zero prep for this section of the show. And so I will just say, I'm good. How are you? I have this annoying old guy who uh, broke my computer and won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> we should start doing. <laughs> <laughs> like our own sponsored bits. <laughs> this episode's brought to you by <laughs> Old People Protection for your software. <laughs> old People Protection for software. <laughs> Make sure to get it <laughs> before you lend your computer to your dad. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard of child locks. I need parent locks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's dig into this episode because I actually really like this one and it's uh, it's much different, significantly different than last week. So let's get started. All right. So this is, as I mentioned, this is a very different episode than what we got last week. We got a slapstick comedy episode last week. This week, very serious. Uh, as you know, you might be able to tell in the title of the episode, The Home Invaders, compared to Made for Each Other that was on last week. Yeah, and it got serious very quick because in the opening so we come in we have a very 80s home it's so affluent that it's comically 80s over the top right the way everyone's you dressed didn't like that extra large sectional <laughs> or the uh, the kids room where they have the giant computer and then there's like the whiteboard on the wall that's like cut into a goofy pattern and all that kind of stuff like it was very over the top 80s it was trying very hard to be the 80s and right in the very beginning so, the tone is very clear it's going to be much different because there's the family's all there and there's a knock at the door they have a maid wife says no she goes to answer the the the, the wife goes to answer the door and outside are three armed men who force their way into the house so there let me stop and just ask two questions right now why are they wearing nylons if you can totally tell what they look like under underneath them they like that smash uh, nose look yeah but i mean you could totally tell what they look like and then did they actually bring flowers they did actually Was bring I, flowers actually they, they actually brought flowers that's pretty prepared if you're gonna rob the place and torture the people like i, I wouldn't expect you to bring flowers they, you know, they were thinking just in case there was some problems at the front door, they might have to sweet talk their way in. Well, are you going to be confused with them being a delivery guy with nylons over their head? <laughs> Maybe they were clearly one of them was holding flowers, but when they bust in, they, you know, they're armed to the teeth. They get everyone at gunpoint. We have a last. So, so in the van, one guy is like, "I'll bring flowers and I'll pretend to be a delivery guy," and, then, and the other guy is like, "No, no, I'll put nylons over my head and I'll." I'll just uh, knock on the door and grab her. <laughs> <laughs> and neither one would agree. So they're like, we'll do both. <laughs> When they bust in, it's very violent. We have a last second scene of where they show the two kids and they're holding each other while while laying in bed. And th- this opening gets straight to the point, very violent, very fast, and it's very short, especially for a Miami Vice open. 
we go, it's maybe two minutes long and we go to the opening credits. Yeah, that's got to be the shortest open that we've ever had. I mean, in, in comparison to, right, where we've had opens where they played two complete songs and then <laughs> aired the entire trip on a boat between Miami and Bermuda or Barbados or St. Andrews, wherever they went. I mean, how long did mm. we watch Castillo swim in the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> Not long enough. <laughs> <laughs> that west that wet mustache just haunts my dreams <laughs> never well, forget when we come out of the credits we go to the precinct and crockett comes stumbling in and at first i thought oh this is just a normal weekday for crockett it looks like he's <laughs> drunk his clothes he's just getting dressed as he's walking down the hallway but no it's three in the morning the b team and the ladies are both there waiting for him as well as um castillo's there too but no tubs Tubbs is mysteriously uh, has taken a leave of absence and they say he's with Valerie in New York and they live with the high life. So there might be another reason why, John, why Philip Michael Thomas or Tubbs, why he would have missed this week's episode considering something that we saw two weeks ago. Yeah, so he is probably touring promoting his CD at this time. So he's hitting all the county fairs. <laughs> <laughs> those, those old folks homes, right? <laughs> he kept going to all all this all the stores and uh you know doing the whole shebang <laughs> so i'm well, sure I, i'm sure uh christian radio show might have had him on and like you know, on the AM stations, not FM, AM. Well, Castillo eventually comes in and he explains to them that there's been a series of home invasion robberies and that the police chief has come down and said he wants full investigation into these home invasions because they're incredibly violent. Violent. The home invaders, they beat up families. They put one person in the hospital with electrical burns. They are... Poke uh, down the eye. <laughs> And that they will be working with a uh, Lieutenant Malone's team, who we find out here that Crockett has a history with Malone, that he was actually trained by Lieutenant Malone before he was lieutenant, and they know each other really well. Yeah, he's basically Crockett's mentor, and it's funny to see how Crockett acts around him. All of a sudden, he's Mr. Company Man, all smiles and jokes and getting along with all the other cops. He sobers up real fast. Yeah, that... Uh, that Midnight whiskey starts to wear off as soon as he hears that Malone's going to be involved. Oh, I love that guy. He taught me <laughs> everything I know. Which, so, honestly, when I when I met Malone, when we meet Malone's character, I'm actually surprised he's like Sonny's yeah. mentor because I thought he would have to be like a womanizing yeah. drunk. Let's 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 get there because the next thing from the precinct that they're going to do is they're going to go downtown to the briefing with Lieutenant Malone's team. Lieutenant Malone is played by Jack Kehoe, who has various TV. He's been a longtime actor, has made a lot of appearances in TV and movies. But I have to say, John, I agree with you. I'm kind of disappointed in who his mentor was. Knowing that Don Johnson playing Sonny Crockett, I totally expected a, a Tom Selleck type actor to be playing his mentor right like i mean yeah. i was hopeful for like a even like a bring dennis farina back and we'll just pretend that we didn't see his character on the show before but this guy i, I thought legitimately that they just that. got like a homeless guy <laughs> especially with the name malone so when i heard malone don johnson mentor i was thinking sam malone that was the level of character i was expecting but that's not what we get uh -huh. wow i mean not even close. <laughs> if you're going Sam Malone, I mean, so you can't you set that kind of bar Danson's... for people, okay? No one will meet it. So, Jenna, yeah, it sounds are like... Are you saying that Danson's better or worse than that we got? Oh, by far better than this guy. I'm Okay, I just said that I thought this guy was homeless. <laughs> I'm saying, like... You can't you can't go comparing people to a Sam Malone bar. That's an unrealistic expectation. I mean, I just There's you know, only yeah, been one. But it's Ted Danson, so I mean, it's not like maybe I was just living the eighties dream. Guy might give him a run for his money. <laughs> maybe I was just living the eighties dream and hoping that Ted Danson and Don Johnson would be in a show together. Maybe I set my I, expectations too high. I just didn't really understand this altogether, though, because. I was picturing that it would need to be someone who looked like he had been working on the force for a lot longer. And I think they were trying to portray him as like even older than Castillo and much older than like old enough that, well, at the end of the episode when he 
gets to his retirement or whatever he he looks like he's roughly the same age but has just been doing way harder drugs yeah and okay so when we meet the robbery team i think i can sum this up really quick they rob houses with automatic weapons and cattle prods it's chicago's fault and unfortunately and it would be nice if we had a detective who used to work robbery hum- robbery in chicago but uh, we don't. And it's very similar to burglaries that were happening in New York, too. And unfortunately, our New York connection is uh, out busy promoting his psychic network or something like that. It's up to Castillo and Sonny to save the day. And I do want to talk a little bit more about this scenario. So, like, they, they give the the rundown. There's been six home invasions in eight weeks. They've all been very violent. And what I wanted to get to is that they go through, they go around the circle, they talk to everyone that's that's there. It is very much a very procedural episode. There's a lot of real cop stuff going on in here, which is different than normal, right? The normal Miami Vice. This was mm-hmm. excessively cop. Like I was saying, like it's it's very much more like a um like a law and order type episode, right? In comparison. But Jenna, that sounds like maybe I'm I'm holding my expectations based on things that we've recently seen. Maybe I'm holding my expectations too high. Well, I mean, if you go back to the maze and they get those wonderfully detailed drawings of the building and they transfer them into a chalk drawing on basically, <laughs> like which no one used. Lack of the worst use of a chalkboard I've ever seen. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that, like, I think that they've done well to set the bar pretty low on the police standards. <laughs> and the other important thing from this scene is that Castillo starts immediately calling out Malone. Immediately, like throwing him down the yeah, gauntlet, yeah, he, calling him out. Just basically looks at him and spits in their face and tells him he sucks. Yeah, he really rips him apart for how they've been monitoring the case so far. And that sets the tone for the rest of the episode between Castillo and uh, and Malone. It sets the, the stage for the rest of the episode. At, at a certain point, the tension gets so high between Castillo and Malone that I thought they were just going to break out into like a thumb war or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the After we get the breakdown from downtown and we see the tension between Malone and Castillo, they immediately go out to we see the home invaders are setting up they're casing another house right we see a car pull up makes it very clear this is our first montage of the episode too we got some music playing they're taking pictures of the house it's a very very upscale neighborhood and you can tell it's upscale because a woman in a bikini comes out to roller skate <laughs> that's how you know yes and suddenly turns into an amateur photographer starts <laughs> snapping photos of her bending over <laughs> then she looks over and so takes a picture of the address maybe a squirrel or two <laughs> <laughs> I just love how they hang signs on their palm trees. That, that that's just like, oh yeah, we've got you know the no soliciting sign pinned up to that palm tree. I can speak from experience living in an area where there's no real trees. You know, here in Arizona, and we still people put signs on their on their cactuses, and they decorate their cactuses for Christmas. I will tell you, it never gets hot enough for someone to go rollerblading in a bikini. Here, I am pretty sure that person would immediately be arrested and thrown into a loony bin. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jenna, and, and that's what I wanted to ask you about. Is it ever worth the risk as a woman wearing a bikini and going roller skating? No. I mean, wearing a bikini roller skating is the equivalent to frying food while not wearing a shirt. <laughs> like, you're asking for trouble. There is a total possibility that you've placed yourself in just the right way, like just the right distance that you're not going to get burned, but you're taking a big chance. <laughs> I, I just wonder, you know, if we were to transport ourselves back to 1985, if that was like the cool thing to do, or if people at home were watching this, like, Look at this dumbass bitch in a bikini and roller. <laughs> Just wish I knew. Like, was it actually cool? <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. And so, a- after and the it's sh- Florida. Yeah. I mean, I guess anything's normal in Florida, right? Think of the chafing yeah, alone. So- okay, like you're you're when you're when you're roller skating and you're cha- you're moving your legs back and forth like that. Oh my god, that sounds horrible. <laughs> well, after this brief montage, we go to the Home Invader secret hideout, and I have to say, I don't think we ever 
actually learn any of their names, do we? Nah, uh, you know what? I don't think we ever do. I just have them as uh, people I know them as. Like, I have the guy that tries to say no to the robbery as the guy from Pulp Fiction who says, my name is Saul and this is between y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bro, how I know him. Hell? You have the most fucking like nuanced references. <laughs> Where in your brain do you fit all of this shit? <laughs> he's he's that guy in Pulp Fiction, and actually, when Samuel later in the movie in Pulp Fiction, when Samuel L. Jackson goes to do his kung fu thing, uh, he's actually partner John Travolta when they're looking for the boxer Bruce Willis, who was also in a Miami Vice episode. See, look, I can just tie it all together. <laughs> Illuminati. Yeah. There, there, our home invaders are having a discussion talking about they all are really nervous about this next job. But our our main guest star, her, Issei, Isai Morales, is telling them, like, look, there's $200,000 on the line. We have this fancy getaway car. There's, you know, it's worth the risk. They're uneasy about it because there's extra security driving around. There's alarm systems inside. They don't like that on this next job. But Morales, he's pushing real hard to get this to, to get this job done by the way i but they do have names jerry and nikki and pete is this <laughs> just like a rule that you had to sign on to play more than one character because yeah, he plays someone different in a later episode yeah he plays felipe cruz so after this brief argument with with the with the home invader team we go we jump to castillo and Crockett, who are out working the case together, which is very strange. I've started to know this. This has a trend with with, with Crockett. How come when they're interviewing like a witness or something, when they're whenever they're at someone's house, he's always looking out the window while the other cops talking to him. He's deep in thought, John. There's so much going on, and he he feels for every one of his victims, and that's what he's here to do. He's talked to victims of the people who were robbed in the very opening of the episode. We learned that the home invaders also hurt. The children, too, damn, uh, messed up one of the kids' hands. And she's really broken up. She says she, she can't remember anything except for that one of them said, is there anyone else in the house? That was the only thing that she, that's the only information that she's able to give them. The only other thing of note in this scene is that Castillo really ratchets up the creepiness. Unnecessarily yeah. quiet and brooding Castillo. I was kind of reminded by this scene. Doesn't Crockett have a kid? Whatever happened to that little bugger? <laughs> he, he's in Georgia. He's still in Georgia. Okay. He's fine. He's fine. We don't need to check in with that. They're doing okay. After we learn nothing from the witness other than they asked if anyone else was in the house, we go to another montage. But this time it's a fantastic montage. Unlike that first one where we just see the woman roller skating, this one we get Castillo is looking through the files at the precinct. Crockett is out working the street in normal Crockett fashion. He's bull- bullying people, threatening to hurt them, and cornering them in alleys. And Castillo is very slowly looking through paperwork, and we're going back and forth, back and forth between the two and and how they work. Of course, somewhere um, in there, Sonny has to stop and talk to some prostitutes, too. So so, you gotta be sure. Doesn't he, like, doesn't he still karate chop someone in this episode? He does some... Oh, no, puts the guy to sleep. He, 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 like, (laughs) (laughs) like, like that weird, like, pinch on the neck that put that puts him to sleep that that's the, touch the, of death. the vulcan um <laughs> that's the vulcan <laughs> no it's a it's the vulcan touch of death <laughs> okay yeah okay i can still learn it well after a night of montaging through the entire night we come to the next day and castillo and crocker to go talk to talk to someone at a jewelry store they they walk in and there's just one lady working behind the counter there's a couple customers inside and immediately the lady behind the counter is like what you want isn't this a uh, high-end jewelry store wouldn't they like be treating everyone nice she's like Pfft. Look at these suckers. What'd you two want? She saw that skinny tie oh. and knew that he was no good. <laughs> oh, yeah. She saw that, like, Sears suit. Can't afford this crap. Get <laughs> out of here. Well, Castillo and Crockett and are... wasn't happy. He was like... Crockett was like, just go get Benny, toots. Yeah, she did, so that's what they're looking for. They're looking for someone named Benny, and she's like throwing some shade back at him. And Sunny says, "Quote: Just find him. We'll talk about what you look like later." Like, oh, Sunny, never change, dude. Never change. What do you mean, never change? <laughs> change now. That was the worst sunny moment ever. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! It gets better because he calls his buddy Angel. The get rid of her, ridderer, to get rid of Sunny and uh, 
Castillo and Sunny. <laughs> oh, the uh, primitive but effective. Yeah, he grabs his uh, he grabs Angel's grapes and puts them in. <laughs> Benny comes out and says, like, look, I'm not talking to you guys about anything. Get the hell out of my store. He calls Angel his, I guess, bodyguard. Crockett just, like, picks he, him up. He's a get her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. How many R's are in that? <laughs> I've got get two, Ritterer. but there should probably be a third. I was trying to get through <laughs> it without calling out the get Ritterer. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Crockett and Cassio leave. They don't get any information out of Benny or Angel. But Benny does drop a hint for us, the viewers. He says that the guys that the Vice team are trying to look for are way more dangerous than the Vice team. And he ain't saying nothing. It's like, okay, well, everyone kind of knows what's happening. Especially anyone because the, the the home invaders, they're stealing. They seem to know what's inside of these houses. Not just they rob whatever's in there. They know that there's jewelry or coins. Although they never approach that in the episode to say how these home invaders have so much information. I guess they're supposed to know that yeah. from that they do so much casing. Yeah, you didn't see him taking all the pictures? <laughs> I mean, if he's going to take five pictures of her thigh alone. Clearly, he <laughs> understands what they have in the house. We're assuming that after a day of them lo- looking around and talking to people, we end up back at a club that night. And of course, it's Crockett, so we're going to end up at the bar at the end of the night. The ladies are there. Crockett and mm-hmm. Castillo were there. Castillo tells the ladies, like, hey, look for hookers who have recently had interactions with a John that's beat them up. They've been aggressive with them. Uh, and then Castillo also says that he talked to a detective in Chicago and he learned that when these home invasions, these similar home invasions that were happening in Chicago, the there was reports of girls being beat up. Now, was this detective named Valerie? And was she with a guy named Tubbs? <laughs> <laughs> Castillo also says that he's not going to the next briefing with Malone. He's just he's not he's not interested in that. I also got the kind of feeling like maybe Castillo was a little jealous of Sonny's relationship with Malone. Yeah, I think a little bit. And it, it's kind of a battle between Castillo and Malone. I don't know what this old guy p- pissing contest is between the two of them. They just like they just bring out the worst. Like everybody's fighting over. It's like a it's like a divorce. Everyone's fighting over Sonny's uh, custody <laughs> of Sonny. So after we end the bar scene, and Castillo says that him and that he doesn't like Malone anymore, or he never liked Malone, he's not going to go to the next briefing. We go to I guess it's that night. There's a robbery happening that night. The home invaders have broken into the house. I'm assuming it's the house that they were casing, but it's yeah. it's a couple. Is it old with the people. old people? Yeah, where they the like, and they don't even so, wake up. They, they the, have to like the, forcibly wake them up. So yeah, this is the house that they were casing because the one of the robbers' argument for why they shouldn't go after this house was because they didn't know the patrols. They had no way of figuring out if cops were going to be driving by, or and they decided to do it anyway. Find out that they probably should have no uh, figured out waited and scoped out the patrol and that's what so the 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 two interesting things here is like is exactly what you're pointing out john is that a cop does come up and stop him or comes up to the car park on the street morales or uh, i'm sorry um pete is in the car in the Get, getaway car parked outside the cop stops comes walking up pete pretends like he's asleep for a couple of minutes and then pulls out a gun shoots and kills the cop inside the home invaders are beating up the old couple and the old man is like refusing to give them any information about what's going on in well where anything's hidden inside of the house yeah and that old guy man he's a tough old guy it actually made me start to question the last victim's husband like <laughs> what's wrong with that guy <laughs> the next morning so. we have we come to the investigation that's going on the house is trashed the old people we find out that the old man he got shot twice but he's still alive he's he's at the hospital but the cop who walked up on pete he's dead and ca- and so now the whole team is there. Malone and his people are there. Castillo and Crockett are there. Castillo immediately starts to question Malone's decision not to seal off the area. And Malone obviously takes that very personal. But Castillo says like he can't defend his actions at all. Even if Malone could put out there some excuse why he didn't seal off the area, Castillo was not hearing it. Oh, yeah. And we it's a very strange missing contest between the two of them. I, it escalated very fast, right? And C- Castillo makes a point very early on that he thinks he's a better lieutenant than than Malone is, but he also refuses to work with them essentially. But I, I don't know. Maybe I'm. Maybe this is just like a like a confirmation bias. But I feel like he gets this way about Sunny and Tubbs, where he's 
like he gets like weirdly defensive like no i'm the best and they're good they like is me he, more hold, hold on hold on is he is he worried that Malone is gonna break su- break Sonny's heart? Is that what it is? He's protecting Sonny. <laughs> no, I think that he's afraid of not Don't having get close someone to, to have. Sonny. He, he's not gonna have a lunch buddy anymore. <laughs> he's gonna have to take Trudy up on that offer finally, and it's gonna be horrible. He doesn't want to do that. <laughs> he just got to ride in the cool car. And, and all right, so let's get to the hookers. <laughs> Sonny pulls Malone aside. Malone is really pissed off at Castillo, but in the end. Sonny convinces him, he's like, hey, maybe you're not handling it the best way anyway. And then Sonny meets with Castillo, and Castillo is really concerned about the investigation. But Sonny says he's got faith in Malone, so he's trying to he's trying to placate both sides. Malone seems to be w- willing to listen. Castillo don't listen to nobody. We go from there to the a hooker's apartment. Or is it is there an apartment or is it like a hotel room? Either way, it's not necessarily on the best side of town. And our ladies, Trudy and Gina, have found a couple of hookers. And one of them has been beaten up pr- pretty bad by their trick. I think they prefer ladies of the night. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All I know is that this hooker's got a mouth on her. Oh, yeah. A really dumb one. Yeah. She's just not understanding the brevity of the scenario, but she's been beat up and she says like, hey, look, he was, he was a good looking guy. He looked rich. He was really, you know, she doesn't really give them any information, but they did find someone like what Castillo. So in this, another point here, Castillo was right. Go find some women, some hookers who have been beaten up by their, by their tricks. Uh, obviously, John, as you mentioned, Sonny gets very frustrated very fast talking to these girls. So. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. She she just she just continually just lays in the sun and suddenly finally just has enough and kind of quips at her. Yeah, so it, it's it's real short scene. We jump to the precinct and the vice team and Malone have been they're working inside of the evidence room. Castillo comes walking in and he's got extra evidence. He has some some information from Chicago and he's telling them like it's matching what's hap- what's happening in Miami as to what they were dealing with in Chicago. And then we have this very strange scene where he goes one by one through all the scenarios that could be like who are the landscapers who who does the you know home yeah, which care yeah, thought, like who services their car who does yeah everything so first it was the landscaper which always you know blame the landscaper first and i'm not just saying that i mean because you I'm look a landscaper. shifty okay well, well john and that's what that's what, what i was going to ask you is like so what have you been up to at the houses you've been going to I'm just going to point it so out that whenever we this, watch okay? these movies or, or like these shows or are the movies that we watch for movie night, John always knows. <laughs> what was that thing that happened the other day where you – oh, building models, where you were talking about b- building model cars and he <laughs> built model airplanes. Like you get it. I said trains. You have he a said pl- to he tell. planes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you this, Okay. Let me tell you this. As a landscaper, man, I could have stolen a lot of crap over the years. People are very trusting to landscapers. All right. I haven't. I've never done that. But I had a property. I had a bank that I used to do work at. And they put the sprink- the controller for the sprinklers in a closet next to the, the uh, vault. And so when I would go in to <laughs> service the the sprinklers and run through the controller, they would let me in to where all the bank employees are and then they would just let me walk by myself down some stairs right next to the open vault with a black <laughs> suitcase and you're gonna you go right there right to that closet yeah right next to the open vault where we keep <laughs> all of our money don't worry about that it's yes. all out don't worry about it but it's right next to it there's yes. no one around <laughs> You're on uh, and your I own. did it. I did it multiple times, and you don't know how much it took for me not to just walk around the corner into the vault and just stuff a couple <laughs> lumps of money into that that uh, suitcase I used to bring in with me. Here's all I'll say: is that every time I hear about a potential robbery in the Seattle area, I don't know where John is. Just saying, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't even the landscaper. It turns out that they they were getting ripped off uh, because they were getting their hair did. It's not even the hair emporium's fault. They're the valet. They're the valet for the hair emporium. Third party service. In a very Castillo manner, we go very slowly, one by one, 
through every option that the people and the services that they use and eventually settle on the hair emporium and while this is going on i'm trying to figure out why zito looks so much like ace ventura to me <laughs> well once castillo works them through again pointing out that he's right malone is wrong they settle on that all the victims have one thing in common that they all get their hair did at the same place it's called the hair emporium yeah. When Where we, I got them extensions. <laughs> yeah. Do we get yet another montage? We get another montage. We go to That's the hair emporium wonderful. and there's music playing and they're showing everyone getting their haircut. And I learned two things from this from this scene. One <laughs> is I learned more about 80s w- women's haircuts. And that was that was a learning experience. But I also learned that apparently beauty parlors were all built in 1985 and have s- never updated anything inside of their facilities since then. Yeah. I'll take this one more montage and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get my slide whistle. And every time you hit a montage, you still get a slide whistle. <laughs> The decoration of like the pink chairs with the seashells on the wall and the fake plants. I'm pretty sure that's every hair salon I have ever walked into. Except now, all the seats are covered with duct tape. (laughs) Uh Where do you get your hair cut? (laughs) (laughs) At the hair important, when the montage eventually stops, it's Gina's there. She's getting her hair cut and she's she's doing her investigation. As Gina's leaving, you know, she's supposed to be playing someone rich. She's baiting anyone who's inside the hair emporium. She goes out to get her car from the valet and pete is out there working the valet gina very quickly picks up that morales is up to something looking good gina picks up very quickly that pete is not on the up and up that he's he's uh reading her as much as she's reading him and she is clearly setting a trap for morales too she lays out like oh my uh her fancy car and she talks about yeah, my husband's she... never around mm-hmm, mm-hmm. she picks up on it very quickly so when we go back to the precinct gina comes walking right back in to go tell castillo's like hey i think it's this guy i think we got him but of course you know before we get there this great scene where gina's gonna go to castillo she's done fantastic police work she's she thinks she's got the person who it is. She comes walking in. The B team are talking to the hookers that they're talking to previously who are looking through a photo book of, of anyone that, that the, for the person that could have been that beat her up. And as soon as Gina comes walking in, both the B team cat call Gina as she walks by. So we have that going for Miami Vice and the B team again. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Take this moment to remind everyone that we have a woman running for president right now. <laughs> It gets oh, Jenny, better. you're going to love next week's episode. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> we go back to, so what happens is, is that Castillo comes out. He tells uh, Gina and Trudy to take the two hookers back with them to see if they can identify the guy, uh, Pete, to see if they can identify uh, that's who beat her up. And at this point, they're just driving hookers around for no reason. <laughs> They and so when they go back to the hair emporium, they uh they do they do identify him. They take him around. She they get the binoculars out. She sees him. She's like, "Yep, that's the guy." They've nailed him. They know exactly who they need to to stake out. We go and while we're still at the hair emporium, we see that Crockett is at a building like across street. He's got binoculars and he's like looking. He's watching I love Pete. That. Yeah, he's watching. It's just really slow, <laughs> panning into him. Really slow. And after like thirty seconds, he just goes nailed you sucker <laughs> yeah and so the scene goes on and all i wrote was sunny looking creepily through binoculars <laughs> like literally the only way that this could get better is if sunny ran back to castillo and told him that he knows who it is <laughs> like yeah, with no. gina and i almost like, had to rewatch it because i swear to god i thought he licked his lips <laughs> Eventually, Pete, he parks a car, he makes a copy of the key, he reads the information on the registration to see what the address is. He runs back over to the payphone, makes a call, changes his shirt before he leaves, because that's the thing, and then runs off. And they decide that they're... Fingerprints, they'll identify me by my shirt. (laughs) The shirt will leave a certain pattern in the seat, and that's how they'll identify (laughs) me. So they decide that they're gonna. The vice team is gonna split up. Castillo and Crockett are gonna tail the woman's car, who he copied the key of, and then the other people are gonna follow Pete. This is the first part of the episode where I where I start to ask, why didn't they figure this out sooner? Yeah, because wh- so he copies the keys in the in the car and gets the info off of the registration. But it's starting to seem like like 
wait a minute, valet, like these are all kind of common things that that like common schemes that people run on people, you know? And it's also like why they don't catch information that becomes important at the end of the episode. Before we get there, let's talk about this old lady that they, they run down and pull over. So they're following this don't old lady me. yeah, <laughs> who is in this Corvette. They pull up alongside her because they're going to ask her some questions because her car, that's the one who he parked. He got all the information of and made a copy of the house key while he was inside of the car. They go to try and pull her over. They flash the badges and she just drives off and we go into a chase scene. And it's like, it, it's it's not someone who's got any bad intent. She just runs off. Some old lady, she just drives off. And eventually they corner her. And when they, after they corner her, they come walk up. They ask her to get out of the car. And she just yells out, like, help, help. They're trying to murder me. My ex-husband's trying to murder me. And then she says, okay. They ask her to get out of the car. And then she says, okay, but don't rape me. Yes. How, how did we okay, get here? Okay, don't rape me, though. I don't understand where this old woman came from and how this became a part of this episode. Like, did... Did they, is this what the comic relief is supposed to be in this episode? I, I guess, you know, because I mean, she's in it throughout the rest of the episode. She comes back up at the last scene of the episode as well. But this is number two problem where I'm starting to question the police work on this case. At this point, they know the valet's into it. This is robbery. This isn't vice. Or leading up to, uh, so now they're tailing people. And they're ju- they're getting ready to start planning an undercover sting. It's like you already know who one of the robbers is. Go get them. Of course, they're gonna they have to bait and wait for him to actually be in the process of the robbery before they'll actually arrest him. And I think the answer to your question is why is Vice involved? This is because the chief of police said the Vice team is no, working I, on this I, case. I know why Vice is involved. I'm I'm asking why they're vicing it up. Um, yeah, I know. I know. That that's what I'm saying. It's like if this is robbery's case. They go, they arrest the valet, and then they pump him for the, to, they try and break him to get the name of the other guys. They have a very particular set of skills, John. <laughs> yes, they but, will but them. all of a sudden, Vice takes over the case, <laughs> and now we've got car chases and undercover stings. Vice needs a reason to shoot to kill, John. And the only way they can shoot to kill is if they catch you in the act. No, they're in Florida. They don't need that. <laughs> okay, so the stage is set. They now know that the home invader is going to go hit this lady's house. The entire... So now we have a split teams. Crockett and Castillo are going to be at the old lady's house. They're going to wait for the home invaders to show up. We also have Malone's team and the other members of the Vice team who are going to tail the home invaders. And they're able to do so for a short period of time. But due to, I don't know how they decide, how they decided this to be okay, a member from Malone's team, as they're following the car that's left the facility, they're tailing them to see where they go. That way they can bust them all and they'll be back up. They can bust them down when they get to the house. The home invaders switch cars. They switch from a car to a to a big van. And one of the Malone team members so says, okay, this... stop here. And I'm going to run up and see where it is. So he runs over. He does what he says he's going to do. He sees that they're switching vehicles. He runs back to his car. And they go, we lost him. So here becomes problem with police work number three. Is how do you lose a big ass van? But this also leads into problem with the... With with the plot too because if they're only stealing jewelry cash and coins and stuff why do they need a big commercial van we know from one of their robberies that they stole two hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff so i don't know maybe they're stealing whole chandeliers and stuff i guess so they they but yeah they just uh, they just they, he just comes back to the car and he's like i lost them it's a big ass white van i they just were can't also, figure out how do you lose they were also right there They were right behind him. He said, stop here. He ran like 10 feet around the corner to see him change the vehicles. And then like they just disappeared as if like the van drove into a big green pipe and appeared somewhere else. (laughs) I'm just just imagining if Florida was like Mario's land. (laughs) Someone's just walking down the street and all of a sudden one of those things come out of the pipe and just eats them. (laughs) So they, they radio Crockett and say, we lost them. You guys are on your own. Or not necessarily on your own. It's like, we lost them. We're coming to you. And, and they say, no, don't come here. We don't want to blow it and have you guys waiting here by the time they show up. A significant Couldn't amount of- follow a van. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> a significant amount of time passes with Castillo and Crockett just sitting there, which I imagine in my head, they don't say two oh. words to each other the entire time. <laughs> nope. No, and actually, my, my reaction to this is Sonny and Castillo are like uh, almost like an old married couple. Castillo's like sitting there like knitting. <laughs> and Sonny sitting there quietly reflecting on his life and thinking Just about realizing. that kid that's in Georgia that he never thinks that he never talks to. Yeah. Hey Castillo. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> After a significant amount of time, if Crockett finally decides I'm gonna call the pre uh, and talk to the old lady who's still at the precinct. He calls. A very awkward con- conversation happens, and what we eventually get out of her that that wasn't her car, that was her daughter's car. So clearly, they're at the wrong house. The home invaders have gone to a have gone to her daughter's home. Meanwhile, the vice team has been staking out her house. Which again, police work. Did they not? How do they not yes. know that this wasn't her car? This was her daughter's car. Yeah, I mean, it is just. Like, especially, why wouldn't, how do they not know this information before launching an entire sting operation? Yeah, I don't know. But they, they rush as fast as they can to get over to the other house. When they get there, you know, the entire vice team is heading there. But, of course, Crockett and Castillo get there first. They get to the driver who's outside in the getaway car. They're able to disable him. And then they come up to the back door and they see that the other home invaders have the family at gunpoint. Oh, did we just skip over Castillo uh, using his uh, Vulcan technique? <laughs> oh, it's, uh, when do we... This is when we get to this. Oh, no, he uses the Vulcan technique on the driver. Sonny's like, you better be quiet over here or I'm going to be real mad. And, like, spins <laughs> into the car and, and Castillo's just like, better yet, go to sleep. <laughs> Which makes me really wish that that could become a thing. Like, Death that's bitch. his, that's, like, his line where he just, like, shows up randomly on their police efforts. You look tired. Maybe you should take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> just like different variations of it. it Talk kind of funny, but it was well, after, that guy. After they, after Castillo gives the driver the Vulcan death grip, they <laughs> <laughs> see through the back window that the fa- family's at gunpoint. They're going to decide on how they're going to go in there and rescue them. Of course, and they're I'm a little very proud of these robbers, though. They they they're wearing hockey masks now, so they're learning. Yeah, they're like almost to the Point Break Reagan masks, right? Like they're getting there. They're on their way. They're they're, they're, om- they're almost Point Break. They're just below Point Break level robbery. Being that they rob high end houses. How is there not another single cop closer than Castillo yeah, no. and Sonny? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Shh, they don't want people to know that that's how they set it up. They, in a very vice effort to to take care of the situation, Castillo throws a table through the window, shoots and kills, and then shoots and kills <laughs> Let's one person. them that we're here. <laughs> I'm surprised that they didn't notice that they were there when Sonny is walking against the slider, like the sliding glass window, and he's just leaning against it. He leads his back against it for like two minutes. It's like, you realize that that's a, that's a gigantic window, right? Like <laughs> If the people tied up inside weren't so scared, I'm sure they would be laughing at this entire situation <laughs> this is a very anticlimactic ending he throws the table through the window they come in guns blazing they kill both the home invaders downstairs morales yells from upstairs like hey what's going on down there as if he didn't hear the gunshots he just heard the table crash through the window he pokes right. his head around the corner sunny shoots and kills him everyone's dead <laughs> suck on that chicago the end <laughs> yeah and that's the end of the home invaders it was a very it was very short very succinct and they just kill all of them the end. Not Miami quite, Vice. Not style. quite the it's, end. It's not, not quite, quite the end. The actual end. But it's Malone close. brings Malone brings Sonny a gift. Uh, yes. And then yes. we find out so that he brought to... him a gift. We, we find out he, he brought him a gift because he is going into retirement because Castillo stared him into <laughs> retirement. Yeah. So it's and you're right. It ends in this very weird scene where Crockett is there with the B team and they're having drinks with the old lady at some diner. And then he they're asking where Crockett and Mal- I mean uh, where Ca- Castillo and Malone are. Crockett gets up to go give him a call because you know. 80s he had to go to the payphone he runs into him at the front door and that's where malone tells him that he's retiring it's like castillo essentially bullied malone into retirement right yeah he stared him into retirement that glare 
it, it's the glare is stronger than we than we know as viewers <laughs> because it up and made this cop just retire. Have you ever done that? Like where you've sat in a room or had a conversation with people and you just don't speak like you just let the silence sit for long enough and people inevitably feel so uncomfortable that they have to like fill the, the space, like fill the void. So I feel like Castillo just do. Does I that. live like, that every well, day and I wish people would just shut up. <laughs> and Malone just like. He's like, oh, well, okay, well, maybe I wasn't, maybe I wasn't the greatest. Well, here are all the problems that I have. And like, it just slowly spirals. And, like 20 minutes later, <laughs> he's like on the couch with an arm over his face. And he's like trying not to cry as he recounts like when his dog died when he was a child <laughs> and it, how he, it was his fault because he was negligent. That time him and Crockett were in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, the ending and, was definitely kind of weird and kind of awkward. And it was like, you know, like, hey, why is that lady here? Oh, Crockett's mentors quitting. And just, yeah, it was just weird. So that sums up this, what I thought was a great episode until we just kind of fell on our face at the very, at the last five minutes of the episode. But I'll save that for our, uh, our review at the end of the episode. Let's move on and talk about the music. There wasn't much music, but it sounds like there's some stuff to cover in this. All right, John, it is, we only got two songs in this episode, right? Yep, just two songs. So we have Destination Unknown by Sly and Robbie, who apparently are like the producer to work with. So they were both each uh, had their own reggae careers in the 70s before they came together. And pretty much they revolutionized reggae. But what's impressive about Sly and Robbie, who sang the song, they have recorded on or produced on over 200,000 recordings. Wow. So like they've produced albums for like or or great musical parts for Bob Dylan, The Rolling Stones, Carlos Santana, Ben Harper, Sinead O'Connor, even Dougie Fresh. They're like super producers. So I was so ready to talk about them, but then I went and checked out the next song, The Glamorous Life by Sheila E. I have to say, I am a fan of Sheila E. Okay, you know who she is. Je- uh, Jenna, do you have any idea who Sheila E. is? I recognize the name, but I don't think I could readily tell you why. <laughs> Okay, so Sheila E. is a singer, but she's also a percussionist and a drummer. And she's most notable for her involvement or working with Prince. She's Um, the badass drummer for Prince, especially during Prince's heyday in the mid to late 80s into the early 90s. She's just a badass drummer. So she's a badass drummer who actually had a little bit of a solo career. Her career started in 1978 when Prince met her at a concert while she was performing with her dad. They joined forces during the Purple Rain recording in which she would provide backup vocals for the song Let's Go Crazy in Erotic City. In 1985 Um, is when Purple Rain debuted in theaters too. So this is Sheila E. being in this episode is makes total sense. Yeah. So uh, as Prince is releasing Purple Rain and, and all of that, she releases her own album, the Glamorous Life featuring this song by, uh, by the same name. And it gets to number seven on the Hot 100 chart. She starts scoring with Prince all over the place. She was even in four movies. Now, three of the movies were just Prince concert movies and stuff. But one of them was called Crush Grew. It had, uh, it, she co-starred with Run DMC, LL Cool J, and Blair Underwood. So yeah, so she was also in some in a couple movies at the time. And then she was also rumored to be involved in kind of a love triangle with Prince while they were touring. While Prince was dating Susan Mel- Melvoyan, who was the twin of Prince's Revolution band member Wendy Melovin, while they were were, while he was together with Susan, there was rumors that he was hooking up with Sheila E. I believe all of that, but it's also because I believe that Prince, the magical sex man that he is, is romantically involved with every woman that ever existed in, during the 1980s. So I'm going to wrap this up with just a couple other interesting 
things that she was involved in. She was the leader of the band for the late for the brief late night television program called The Magic Hour with Magic Johnson. <laughs> Yes, that existed. <laughs> <laughs> she was also a member of Ringo Starr's Ringo Starr All-Star Band. I took a turn. Uh, it, How did we get here? Yes. How did we get to a where yes. the Beatles are involved? <laughs> yes, now the Beatles are involved. And so she played with them as their drummer for, uh, in 2001, 2003, and 2006. That must have been later when Ringo can justify in some way having a significantly better drummer than himself around. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so now that he's the only Beatle alive. Wait, what? no, Paul McCartney's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't look it. And something for you, Dominic. Did you know Sheila E. played percussion on the Phil Collins cover, True Colors, in no. 1998? Oh. That is Sheila E. Nice. Whoa. That is. Nice. So I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs> I knew Sheila E. was a badass and uh, just confirms it all the way through. Let's, uh, let's move on and talk about our final thoughts of this episode. All right, Jenna, how, what are your final thoughts? Why don't you lead off here? What is your final thoughts on this episode? Episode 20, our episode 20, because the pilot is two episodes for us, The Home Invaders. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't like, eh, eh. I wanted his boss, I wanted the former boss Malone to be someone different. I didn't like the guy that they picked and that affected my interest level in the whole thing and i didn't understand how i don't understand when castillo plays this like jealous lover role like he does it's just it's weird to me so <laughs> it was good it wasn't great i don't know next yeah yeah, yeah. And, you know, and i know that we're coming up to some great episodes as we end this season john what are your final thoughts on this episode so my final thoughts are I agree with Jenna. I was kind of hoping that Crockett's mentor was going to be a little more iconic or just over the top. And I was a little disappointed in the Roberts as well, you know? I was hoping for some kind of theme, you know, like like they all wore the same color headbands or something, you know? Like, <laughs> they were all former members of some gang from the Warriors. Exactly. That's kind of what I was expecting because that's what I expect with her, like, group criminals in Miami Vice is I'm expecting like gang you know so there's supposed to be like a theme I don't know something about Crockett and Castillo working together just doesn't work the same way that Crockett and Tubbs working together does uh, I'll be much happier next week when Tubbs is back from touring Canada and what, <laughs> what other uh, whatever other th third world country will have him <laughs> Well, you know, I have to say I like this episode, even though it kind of fell flat at the end. I really liked it because we got back to classic Vice. You know, it was a um, it was a more realistic story. It was kind of different Vice because it was like kind of a Law and Order feel that was going along with it. it. Was very procedural. They went through a lot of rules. There was a lot of scenes where they're talking about evidence or ways that they can bring someone down. So it was it was like a Vice episode, but more detailed on the police aspect of it rather than the running guns Sonny Crockett style. I did, I have to say, I did miss Tubbs. I missed not having him around, although C C Castillo was great. You're right. Crockett and Tubbs are made for each other and the p only police work that should be done on the Vice team should be where Crockett and Tubbs are working together. So, but I still say, I like the episode. I'm excited for the our last episodes of this season because I know that it's going to end so strong and we needed this little hop get us to those final three episodes from what was happening last week where we have Noogie and Izzy and and the B team and all this all that stuff that was happening last week we needed that little hop to get there so I enjoyed it I'm excited for the end of the season and that's going to conclude this our rundown of episode season one at episode 20, The Home Invaders. As I mentioned, we're coming up on the end of this first season. So a little schedule update. We will be running through the last of the season. Then when we get to the end of the season, we're going to have some review episodes. So we would love to hear from you. What are your favorite episodes of season one? We would love to know what your favorite episodes are from season one. You can hashtag those GWTH for Go With The Heat on Twitter or email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your favorite episode, your favorite guest star, and your favorite music because we're going to split those up and we're each going to talk about those topics in episodes as we, as we end season 
season one and get ready for season two. So we would absolutely love to hear from you and what your favorite parts are, favorite episode, favorite music, and favorite at and favorite guest star from season one. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can subscribe anytime by going to our website, go with the heat.com, click on subscribe, find all the ways to subscribe. We're on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, traditional RSS. You can pretty much find us any way and anywhere that you prefer to listen. You, as I mentioned, you can contact us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. You can email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We'll see you all next week. Bye, pals. Bye. Bye.